originally it came with a bull back made out of one piece of wood and they would shape the bull back and the neck and then they'd take the top would be flat like this and they would go in there and they cut it the hole out the sound hole and then they take that out <clears throat> they go in and they with tools they shape the body inside the body so that the wood would be real thin to resonate well with the music with the uh, strings and then they put a new uh, sound hole in like this they sh they carve it up like this or put different carvings in it I've seen one with a um, a colonial era type of uh, picture with horse and wagon and stuff like that. So, pretty neat. Um, this came known as the Whore of the Tavern to the upper, P upper echelon because it was played in the taverns and everybody had their hands on it. So, <laughs> uh, that's a sitar. Originated in Spain. Therefore, England didn't like the Spaniards, they didn't like the French, they didn't like much of anybody. And um, they would, it wasn't real popular in uh, England, um, especially among anybody that had any money um, or any level of, you know, in their citizenship. And uh, so, it did become popular in the mid seventeen uh, hundred, eighteenth century, and most popular in the twentieth century, nineteenth century and twentieth. Um, had the the tied on frets, and it had the necklace straight <coughs> like this. They had a nut in there, which would be made out of a bone of some sort, because it'd be hard and uh, used friction tuners and cat gut for the strings and the frets. Um, remember cat gut, I explained, was made out of the um, uh, intestines of a goat. Mm -hmm. They don't like this very much. And, uh, but unfortunately cat gut has gotten really expensive now because it has, um, you get in trouble when you chase a goat around with a knife. <laughs> uh, so you have, to, you have to buy it made up. And uh, it's very fragile compared to the nylon and very um, hard to make, like I say, two of them sound exactly the like. So anyway, it's got a very sweet sound. Now it's out of tune again. Yeah, it's not in tune at all. Just about 10 minutes at in tune. Um, so anyway, it's got a sweet sound, it's very light, the case I have is a wooden case over there, it's probably about 10 times the weight of this thing, and that's how light it is. Again, this has got um, tiger maple back, and that's pretty much all the instruments I got here for you that were here before. So. Thank you. You're welcome. If the Indians come across the, the palisade, they will be shot at with muskets. And friendly Indians were given silver badges to wear. If you have one of those, you could cross, but anyone else would be shot. Have you guys heard of this wall that was in Virginia in the 16th? So some people have, most people haven't, because within 10 years, that wall rotted away. No one wanted to maintain it. So there was a wall in, in Virginia, but it was only here for about 10 years. And that was known as the Peninsula Palisade. Yeah, but right now you're in 1620, and that's a time of peace, right? You're, you're having a period, there was the first Anglo-Palatine War, and so for eight years, you're seeing more and more settlers coming over. And does anybody know why the colonists came to Virginia in the first place, what their goal was? Anybody? Not at, not at Jamestown. Tobacco. Yeah, so yeah. remember, Jamestown is about yeah. money, right? This is a, and Virginia is they about money. They were looking money. for a place to grow tobacco. Right, and so remember, this, this is a company in charge, right? If, if we're all settlers here in the early 1600s, we're working for the Virginia Company of London. They basically got a charter from the king, and he says, I give you permission to come to Virginia to settle it, to hire people, to rent ships, and in return, I get a 10% cut of all your profits, right? And so the settlers coming here, 
they're trying to extract raw materials and send them back. Early on, they're looking for gold and silver, timber, things like that. And it's not until the 16 teens that they figure out, hey, we can make money growing tobacco. And when you're done chatting with me, make sure to go in that tobacco barn directly behind us and you can look up and see that tobacco. Now, unfortunately for the Virginia Company of London, they're too much in the red. They have lost thousands of pounds on settlers dying, lost equipment. And so even though the individual colonists will start to make money, the Virginia Company has dissolved in 1624. So that corporation never proves profitable. Is this the type of the different the tobacco barns that they work with? Yeah. We're seeing here at the plantation. Uh, big enough for the planter, his wife, and any children he may have. They would probably sleep up in the, uh, the raft there. Um, as we're heading into the Christmas season, we're going to be doing a couple things to liven up the house because we know that the winter here in Virginia, just like it is in England, is dark, it's dour, it's cold. Can get kind of depressing so we want to liven the place up by bringing in greenery so we have uh sprigs here we got holly and ivy on the door and that's going to remind us that the green is coming back uh, as soon as spring is around the corner now another tradition that's going to be seen here in the colony excuse me coming over from england as well but being introduced from the holy roman empire is the yule log so the yule log is going to be a gigantic um piece of wood is brought in on December 25th, put into the fire, and burned for the next 12 days, so the 12 days of Christmas. And that's going to be a festive center point for the house. Um, as people are coming in, they're going to look at the you know, Yule log. People are going to come around to it um, as they have um, other festivities within the home. And what we see is leading up to Christmas, is going to be a, a bit dour you know there's not a whole lot of eating going on um, but as soon as christmas comes in 25th there's going to be a lot of festivities a lot of merrymaking of drinking a lot of eating uh, not much work being done as they celebrate those 12 days in preparation for the coming new year and one thing you always have is going to be a powder maker so this is a predefined uh volume of powder 50 grains in this case for my particular gun so to start, you take that horn and you pour that powder in. You look. It takes a while to load it. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. It takes about a minute. Oh know? gosh. Now I think of it again. The the civilians, when they're doing this, it's because they're out hunting. Right? They're not designed for warfare okay, necessarily. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they're taking their time. For yeah. them, it's all about the accuracy when you fire. Uh -huh. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of that powder and I'm pour it right into there. It looks like a spoon. Uh, okay. It's called the pan. Uh -huh. Now what's going to happen is this flint is going to hit the dog right here when I close it up. Okay. When that happens, it's going to spark and hit that, that powder right there. That's going to cause the spark to then go into the hole, the touch hole, and then hit the powder that I'm about to pour down the barrel right now. Oh my God. How are y'all doing today? Okay. So now my powder is set, my next step would be to reach into my hunting bag and take one of my round balls, okay? So I'm gonna have, not gonna actually fire, I'm gonna pretend to. What I would also do is open up my patch box and I'm gonna take one of my squares of cloth. This is just linen, extra linen scrap cloth, okay? Just like that. I'll put the cloth right here. I'd seat the ball on top of the cloth, and now I'm going to draw my ramrod, and I'm going to ram all that home. Yeah, this isn't for self-defense. <laughs> okay. So I now have, and I'm return that, of course. This is one of the most important steps. Without this ramrod, this is a seven-pound paperweight. <laughs> so I'm now ready to fire. Now that process I was doing pretty slow as a demonstration. Again, typically about a minute for this weapon. For the weapons that the colonial soldiers were using, the, re the regular regulars there, the brown vest in Charlottesville, three rounds a minute. Actually, it's pretty quick, okay? But it's also very measured because they only carry 19 to 23 rounds in their, in their box. So you shoot them all up in 10 minutes, 
you've got nothing left. You have to come off the line. So this is now ready. So again, the process is going to be come to full cock. I pull the trigger. The flint comes down and hits the pan. That will send sparks into the touch hole. And that will send the powder down in the weapon downrange, the charge downrange. So it's a pretty precarious, I mean, it's a complex process. Um, and a lot of things can go wrong, but this is the top technology of the day. So now that I'm loaded, I've got to unload. So y'all ready to see me shoot? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how the deer gets away. <laughs> All right. So we're going to have our other our. Virginia Wrangler uh, loaded his weapon as well. Are you ready to go? So right now you can see a little bit of the comparison of the loading of the two different types of weapons and the loading speeds. Sixty, hundred and seventy 170 years ago and there are going to be three things to think about kind of with Christmas that still are some you know big traditions with this and the big centerpiece of course is, is the Christmas tree which comes from the great social influencers of the 19th century you, you guys follow anybody on the gram that you, you're getting your influence from no no right right well who in the 19th century are the great influencers and in setting a lot of really middle-class standards and fashion why Prince Albert and Queen Victoria. I mean, this is the height of the British Empire at this time, and it's carrying over into the United States. Tartans, right, even plaids, that was something that Prince Albert really liked when he went to Scotland, and that became uh, very much a fashion piece of the 19th century, for, for gentlemen in particular. Tartans and all that came into a rage. Uh, and Prince Albert, German origin, he brings the Christmas tree, this little, you know, folk tale bit from, from, the, from the Black Forest area of Germany, carries that to England, and it's going to be produced. Do you imagine how well that looks in a uh, newspaper, right? A black and white newspaper period. Well, it's in periodicals. It, this tradition carries over, uh, and it certainly is, is eaten up by Americans and not really been let go. Uh, there are other, so the Christmas tree is a centerpiece there, but there's other things that are, uh, you know, uh, coming about in the 19th century are part of Christmas. Um, you know, what's the story we tell the children? You know, we hang our stockings with care. That comes from, you know, to us night before Christmas. Well, that's in 1847 story and that's gonna be certain passed around and produced in large ones the song that really you know it doesn't, doesn't mention the word christmas in there but it's not christmas without jingle bells right which initially is one horse open sleigh that's 1857 and it's written by a man who's from connecticut he's living off in georgia do you have many sleigh rides down in savannah georgia no but he's nostalgic he misses that and isn't that really often what christmas is about i mean how often are we looking for the nostalgia through a tradition, through a memory, or passing that on. So I think, you know, even though it doesn't say the word Christmas in, in Jingle Bells, it's forever is a Christmas story because it's just not something you miss. You guys want to hear it? Yes. You, you're gonna sing, we're gonna hold you to the lyrics. You gotta, you gotta hit, hit the lyrics, yes? <laughs> so 
the horse in the song Jingle Bells is moving down a snowy road at night. And what's the car horn of the period? It's the bell, right? All right, so imagine being in a nighttime dark road. It's snowing. And there's only one way you're going to stay alive, and that's that bell, right? But it also marks the speed of the horse. All right, let's go to pace the song. Here we go. Yeah, right? you, we, I told you you're gonna hold you to it. Oh. <laughs> Alright. Alright, let's go. We'll go back into it. The first part is dashing through the snow. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's go What happens after that part of the song? What's the what does the song end with? Hey! Oh, okay. Okay. So the end of the song is the fun part, which is a day or two ago I thought I'd take a ride, and soon Miss Fanny Bright was sitting by my side. Horse was lean and lank. Misfortune seemed his lot, and then we hit a snowy bank, and there we got all slop, which is turned over. So what's the song really about? Crashing. Crashing yep. a sleigh on a snowy day. All right, so what happens when you're at a holiday party, and um, you go into that bowl at the end of the table, and you're drinking from it, and then you go home, what happens? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, this is the first song that really makes people aware of getting behind the wheel. <laughs> Inebriated. Uh, so, wait a minute. What other songs have alcohol in them from the period? Do you guys know what this is? Holly. All right, what famous Christmas song? Dead mm -hmm. the Hall. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. All right, it's one of the, one of the, okay. You guys know the words of that? De deck the Halls with Bows of Holly. Follow along, right? You know that? Okay. You guys know the bad part of the song? You know the ah. All right, so at the part where it gets bad is fill the meat cup, drain the barrel, la 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 la. Okay, you know it today because they sometimes change the words for moral reasons. Don or now, gay or pal, la 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 la. Right? That's not the original verse. It's fill the meat cup. Drain the barrel, fa la 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 la. You guys know what meat is? Sure. Alright. So why in the world would some versions of these songs not want to have alcohol in them or the illusion of drinking during the holidays? What's well, a big social movement of the nineteenth century? Temperance. Better known as prohibition. Yes. So the question is in our 1860 gathering, Christina. Are we going to have a lot of sugars and alcohol, even with the temperance movement? Oh, yes. <laughs> Can you give an idea what we might be serving? Sure. So, we've got eggnog here. This is usually 1611 to 1622. Three centuries of Virginia Christmas. We're covering the 1600s, 1700s. And you are now in a room that has two different decades happening. 1860 at that end. I'm, I'm 1820. Okay. And you know who I am, right? Father Christmas. Thank you very much. I've got a lot of weird answers today, but <laughs> Father Christmas is correct. Uh, the, the, Chris, the, the, the Santa Claus people think of, uh, Comet Clark Moore writes a visit from the St. Nick, I think 1821 or something, and you will see a guy looking like Santa Claus eventually by about the 1840s, 1850s. Uh, the full red suit and the look that people know today is the, is the Coca-Cola ad campaign from I think the 1930s or 40s, and that's what people know. But in England, you still have Father Christmas in the 1820s. And the question a lot of people have is, what are you doing in Virginia? <laughs> uh, and the fact is, the Virginia planters viewed themselves as aristocracy, because America has no aristocracy. And they put themselves on a par, rightly or wrongly, with the English aristocracy. So some up upscale Virginia planter households would have a celebration that did not include Santa Claus, even though he was a very American thing, but Father Christmas instead, because, uh, again, you want to show off your English connections, even if you don't really have any. So you have my 
parlor here and what you're seeing hanging from the fireplace are pomanders. Have you guys made those before? Yeah, aren't these great? This is something that uh, has a good story behind it because today you can go to Kroger and get the ingredients for this for, you know, eight bucks. But cloves have historically been hideously expensive going back thousands of years. They're terribly expensive. And oranges, before the railroad could bring fruit from places like Florida, in Virginia you didn't have these very often. And if you could get your hands on an orange, uh, there's a scene in the movie Little Women, which is New England, uh, where that one orange one of the girls has is like, oh my gosh, it's an orange. So if you're hitting 1820 in Virginia, and you go to your friend's parlor at Christmas time, and you see this, well, first of all, it's going to smell really good. If you've ever had constant comment tea, orange and clove. Great combination. But what you're doing is you're trying to make the room smell nicer, but also show off. Because this would have been a very expensive and extravagant treat just to have hanging by your fire, or hanging on your Christmas tree. And again, today it's just the opposite. Today it's very easy to find the, 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 the means to buy these, uh, the, the ingredients. But this would have been a, a symbol of, of, of uh, prosperity in your house. So I thought how appropriate uh, for Henricus, since we are open <laughs> and many places aren't, celebrate by putting some of our best stuff out. Ah, bright light. Does anyone have any questions? Have you guys been?